ever see these awkward conversations where someone tells you that you're too expensive and they've decided to cut back or go with someone else who's cheaper? One of the biggest challenges when it comes to both winning and retaining clients is overcoming these types of objections. So in this episode, we're talking about the two main types of objections you'll face and how to overcome them. Hello, I'm Laura Davis. And I'm Laura Moore, and we're the two Lauras. And just like you, we often feel really awkward dealing with objections. So we try and do everything we can to stop them from ever happening. There are two types of objections that all businesses face. There's tangible constraints. Now, this is something that literally prevents someone from investing. For example, there's a lack of time or a lack of money. And the second is their limiting beliefs. A limiting belief is essentially a fear caused by their mindset, limiting their choices by making them believe something that is not necessarily true. So, for example, it won't work for my business. I'm not ready to outsource. Now, by removing those types of fears, you can help someone feel more comfortable spending money with you. So let's just go back a bit and let's start with the tangible constraints, because I think they're the ones that you're most likely to hear directly from a client or a potential client. And the number one tangible constraint is a money focused objection. It's too expensive. We've all been told that. And you've probably heard this from a client in the past. And it can feel really personal when someone says that, can't it? Yeah, but remember that money is a very, very complex issue. We all value it differently and everyone has a very different relationship with money. Some of us are spenders like me. (laughs) Some of us are savers like you. And so dealing with this objection can really be quite complex. Yeah, and there's usually two reasons that you'll hear this kind of objection. Either it's because they don't see the value in what you're offering them or they're comparing you with an alternative solution. So a quick example, I recently paid to watch Top Gun Maverick on my Skybox at home. It cost me £13.99. Now for me, that was an absolute bargain because it means that I don't have to try and find somebody to look after William. If you're a new listener, by the way, William is my son, he's severely disabled. So finding somebody to look after him is really, really difficult. But I didn't have to do that. I paid $13.99, so I therefore didn't have to leave my house. I didn't have to pay for to park. I got snacks from Tesco's, which were easily a third of the price in the cinema. And so to <laughs> me, that was a really good purchase. Like it was a good investment of my $13.99. But when I told my friend that I had just paid to watch this movie, she was absolutely gobsmacked. And she thought that it was like a really indulgent purchase because I'd paid $13.99 to watch one movie. And her theory was that you can pay the same amount and watch a whole month's worth of Netflix movies. So the difference of our opinions comes from what we're comparing it to. I was comparing the cost and the stress of going to the cinema, whereas she was comparing it to a monthly subscription on Netflix, which wasn't really a comparable solution because Top Gun isn't even on Netflix at the time. But it just kind of shows you that different people value things differently depending on what they're comparing them to. There is good news, though. You can prevent these objections from ever happening in the first place. Okay, so let's just talk about how we're actually going to do that. Okay, so firstly, you need to position your service so that somebody sees the value, which is why I saw the value in paying that $13.99 because it was positioned to me that I could stay at my house and I could, you know, watch this movie that I've been wanting to watch. But if you, for example, were working with, let's say you, your client is a female business owner, they print t-shirts, they do it all at home, they've got two young kids and a dog, you know, they're really busy. So just knowing that small amount of information about this potential client Which do you think that client would pay more for? Would they pay more to a social media manager who says that they're going to post on Instagram three times a week and get them more followers 
Or are they going to pay more for somebody who acknowledges that she's a really busy mum, that she's trying to do everything while the kids are around, print these T-shirts and what have you, and suggest that actually they work on a really strategic launch plan on Instagram so they can focus on getting the majority of her sales during term time so she can have school holidays off with her kids. Which one of those are you going to pay for? They're probably both the same service. Yeah, 100%. And it's such a good point, isn't it? Just identifying those points that make someone feel like they're, they've been seen. Yeah. It's about like listening to what your customer's telling you, isn't it? Not just getting the, the top level, oh, I want to post on Instagram and I need to get 25 followers or whatever. That's not the thing, is it? It's when are you going to have time to do the work so you can sell these t-shirts? Yeah, you need to dig a little bit deeper, don't you? Definitely. Okay, so the second way to stop this happening is to remove the comparison. So set yourself apart by owning the category or the niche that you serve. So for example, position yourself as that go-to expert for lead generation for seven-figure business coaches or the social media trainer for restaurants based in Birmingham. And if people are still comparing you with someone else, then you need to make sure that your offer looks like the best option by providing proof. You can do that by showing the results you've got for other clients, maybe sharing reviews, success stories from the past customers, etc., and showing behind the scenes so they can see what you do isn't the same as others. Even if the only reason they think that is because that other business doesn't show behind the scenes. So this is like Knowlton are really good at this. They're really good at positioning themselves as like the only option because they not only like share the results of what they've got for their clients, but they show behind the scenes of how they're doing this work for their clients. And no one else is doing that. It's really difficult to find other agencies who look like they're comparable to Knowlton. It's how you separate yourself out, isn't it? And how you show behind the scenes of what you're actually doing can really help to make you stand out as, as different to other people. And it can help you, which is the most important thing, your potential client or their potential client see the value in what they're paying. They see actually this isn't an easy, quick thing that I'm outsourcing. This is massive and there's a lot of work people manpower that goes into producing the amazing videos that they do so yeah they're doing well yeah like lots of businesses would think that it doesn't take much manpower to create like a five minute video but when you see the behind the scenes videos from Knowlton and they've got like 20 staff there and all these different really (laughs) expensive cameras you immediately see the difference don't you 100 percent So the second type of tangible constraint, um, so the first one was money. The second one is time objections. And these kind of objections typically fall into three categories, really. So the first one is that it's the wrong time. So they feel like this is not the right time for them. They should wait. And in that case, you need to make sure that what you're saying to these people or the content that you're creating helps people to understand that actually, no, now is the best time by showing them what will happen if they wait and show them, Mm. you know, the negative side of putting that decision off. The second one is that they won't have time to do whatever it is that they need to do. And you might think that outsourcing their marketing will free up their time. And that might be true. But what they might be worried about is how much time it's going to take them to find the right person to do their marketing, to onboard them, to hand everything over, to get contracts signed, to manage that like initial part of that working relationship. So your potential clients need to really understand how much time that will take. And you need to take time to make sure that they understand that the benefits outweigh those initial negatives and they really understand how much time it's going to take. Yeah. And I think these are, these are great opportunities for your content Mm. to go out and put on your social media, put on your website, explain to people the process you go through when you start working with a new client. And you can show it, can't you? You can show behind the scenes of working with a new client and what goes into it. Yeah. So if you've got someone who is hesitating because of those reasons that Laura said, and then you've created a reel or a 
TikTok or whatever platform you're on that shows them that nice, slick, efficient way of onboarding a new client. That could be it. That could be all they need to make them go, you know what? I am going to make the jump and make the leap and, and outsource this social media or ads or whatever it may be. So just think about how you can kind of present that to your client. The third and final one is that they are worried the results will take too much time to achieve. And this is quite a tricky one because we all know that marketing is a slow game and results will often take a while to achieve. But the longer they take to start, the longer they'll be waiting. Yeah. So again, it's like showing the results that other people have got and stuff, isn't it? Yeah. But without making false promises, there's this risk here that you say, I'm going to promise you 10 times ROAS or (laughs) I'm going to promise you this kind of return that we see all those gurus talking about on social media. But it's the fastest way to fail is by setting yourself up for promises that you are not able to keep. Those are the tangible constraints. Now let's have a look at some of the limiting beliefs. So the key to managing your audience's limiting beliefs is to remember that they are simply beliefs or opinions. They are not facts. Yeah, exactly. And a belief or like an opinion can be changed easily if you present the person with the right information. And so you need to create content that handles people's limiting beliefs. But in order to do that, you need to uncover what they are, what those limiting beliefs are that your particular audience has. So you need to get to know your audience really well and really understand them. You can do that by creating like conversational content, really paying attention to the comments. You could ask them directly, like what actually is holding you back? And you can do that with a a one-to-one conversation with someone or in your content. It's just getting under the skin of people, isn't it? And really understand what their opinions are, what's holding them back. Maybe it's that they've heard something from somebody else who's put an opinion into into their mind. And it's just understanding all of those things. You can also use social proof to overcome limiting beliefs. So you can show that people who are just like them, people who've got those same beliefs, have overcome them and have got really good results. So you can use social proof to show that. So that if somebody thinks that, oh, it's not going to work for me because I'm in this type of business or I sell this type of thing, by showing something that's very similar to them and that they've got results, it immediately gets rid of that opinion because it proves that it wasn't a fact and that can work for somebody else. So social proof is really key in this kind of stage, isn't it? It can create the FOMO as well, can't it? When you put the social proof out there, it makes people go, well, hang on a minute. I want that. Yeah. And I I don't want to miss out on this opportunity. So social proof is so, so powerful. Yeah, definitely. On that note, because we know obviously how important social proof is, um, if you're enjoying this episode, please do go and leave us a five star review wherever you're listening, uh, because we love a bit of social proof too. Okay, so overcoming people's objections starts with understanding your audience and making sure that your content reverses their objections before they actually set in. We hope you've enjoyed this episode and we'll see you next week.